Hello everyone and welcome to Uses of Nuclear Thermal Propulsion in Kerbal Space Program 1.8.1 with Realism Overhaul. When I talk about nuclear thermal propulsion, I mean the situation where we have a nuclear reactor of um, reasonable size. Uh, that propellant is being passed through, that propellant is being heated up by the reactor and expelled out the tail in order to provide thrust. Uh, in general, this kind of system does not provide electricity. Uh, the kind that does provide electricity would be called bimodal. So in that case, the reactor is both providing thrust and also providing electricity. But normally, as far as the prototypes that have existed, they do not do the bimodal thing. They just provide the power. Now, there is another whole category of nuclear propulsion called nuclear electric propulsion. And that is a situation where the reactor is providing power and it is powering ion engines. So instead of having ion engines with solar panels, you have a nuclear reactor powering the ion engines. And that is another way to propel things in space. Uh, nuclear thermal propulsion gets about 800 to 900 seconds of ISP, could go up to 1000 if you're using liquid hydrogen. The downside of liquid hydrogen is that it takes up a lot of space, it's not very dense. And it is also super cool, so you have to cool, keep it cool, and that is a problem we'll talk about in greater detail. So it is difficult to keep liquid hydrogen cool for a very long period of time without it boiling off, so that's a hindrance. Nuclear electric propulsion, the main obstacle is that it's expensive, the propellant itself is expensive, but it's storable. It's usually xenon gas or something like that. And so you can take it out to a long distance. And we have sent ion engine missions to great distances successfully. So there's no problem with that. The reactor is a whole other thing. But we have experience with reactors in submarines, for instance, and uh, in other applications on Earth. And generally, they last for a substantial number of years before having any problems. So, and as far as having people live anywhere near a reactor, we have some experience with that again with submarines. So there's some, some level of experience there. But uh, we are going to start off with the sort of first proposal. The first one that people encounter, I guess, is putting a NERVA on top of a Saturn V rocket. So the NERVA was a prototype engine that the US developed. Unfortunately, uh, this I think it's supposed to be resized to where the nodes are, but that isn't happening right now for whatever reason. Anyway, uh, the stats of the NERVA, this is the NERVA XE100. It has 239 kilonewtons of thrust, which is not much. 60 ignitions, 898 vacuum specific impulse. Uh, so it is roughly twice as efficient as a hydrogen oxygen engine, specifically the hydrogen and oxygen engine that is used on this stage. Oops. This is the J2 engine. And this has this is the final J2 engine, not the J2S. And this has 424, so you can see that's about double, double the efficiency. Uh, however, the thrust is very low compared to the thrust of the J2. The J2 gets 1,023. The NERVA gets only 239. Worse, the engine mass of the J2 is only 1.6 tons. The engine mass of the NERVA is a whopping 10.4 so the question is, if we did do a straight up replacement with, uh, with the NERVA instead of the J2, is it a good idea at all? Right now we're carrying a nominal load to the moon for Saturn V, uh, 44.9 tons, uh, let's just call it 45, and that gets us 13,000 meters per second of ISP on this. Now, the way that the replacement would have worked is actually using the hydrogen tank from the S2 stage. We could use the entire S2 stage and fill the oxygen tank with hydrogen as well. That's an option. So let's see what happens, how much delta V we get with the same load. Now, if it had the oxygen, this would be a very heavy upper stage. There's no way Saturn V could carry it. But if we dump the oxygen, the oxygen is most of the mass because, again, hydrogen doesn't, uh, ha doesn't have much density. So if we remove that, we get 144 tons. So we're just using the hydrogen tank here. We're not filling the oxygen tank with hydrogen as well. And you can see that the wet mass is 95 tons here. The dry mass is a uh, horrendous 27.46 tons. Keep that in mind because, again, hydrogen 
Anyway, but uh, let me remove this and this. Uh, this tank, you can see, is 124 tons. The dry mass is much nicer because it is hydrogen and oxygen, and the oxygen tank is most of the mass. So uh, we have room to spare on here in terms of how much mass we can add and still have the lifter do its thing. However, remember the Nerva does not have as much thrust as the J2. So if we try to put the Nerva on this, it might not be able to get to orbit. Uh, let me just uh, tweak that in. But let's say, let's just say, so what we're about to see is the reason why people uh, fret about, well, how am I going to use nuclear thermal propulsion? I mean, we've got, yes, we've got a lot more delta V. We've got about a thousand meters per second more. That's good. The bad part is we've got a 41 minute burn time because again, the engine takes, uh, it has less thrust as one quarter of the thrust, less than one quarter of the thrust. And so our thrust weight ratio is bad, which means that we can't really carry a heavier load or anything on here because the second stage will have to get us much closer to orbit than it used to. And we may, might need to underfuel this. So the bang for the buck is, you know, questionable, especially since the nuclear engines in principle cost more because of the nuclear um, material. So, but, you know, you do get a little bit more out of it. Is this the optimal situation? No. But I, I think not many people uh, appreciate that you can just put the S2 stage like this. And we could uh, fill up the oxygen tank with more liquid hydrogen. But then we get a one hour burn time. We do get to 15,000 meters per second. But there's no way this is going to end up getting to orbit because uh, it takes about 9,500 to get to orbit ideally. And the Saturn V, because it has such a low thrust weight ratio, ends up taking a little bit more than that. And if you add these two stages together, it only gets to 8,300. So you're going to need at least 1,200 from the nervous stage in order to get to orbit. And if it's going to take, let's say, 15 minutes for you to get that, then you're going to end up right back in the atmosphere and dying. So so that's part of the problem. You can't really overfuel this that much. In fact, you might have to cut it down to a much lower amount. But you'll get a little bit more. The question is whether it's worth the cost compared to a J2, which is cheaper. And again, uh, part of the problem is the density of the fuel. And part of the problem is the fact that the J2 is so heavy, and not the J2, sorry, the Nerva is so heavy. Remember, this is just uh, 140, uh, this is all, all together, 145 tons. But of that, the Nerva itself is 10 tons. So that's a bad dry mass. And we could bump it up, but uh, and that would slightly improve the situation, but not the burn time. Anyway, so that's sort of option number one for using a a Nerva and that's as a pure upper stage so more or less I would say as a pure upper stage we don't necessarily want to do that now let's take a look at a sort of Soviet nuclear engine the one that they made wasn't Nerva and I made a model of it because I thought it was cute this little fellow was what the Soviets tested. It's only 35.3 kilonewtons, so much, much smaller. There are uh, equivalent nuclear engines that the U.S. tested earlier, and uh, like the Pee Wee or something. And it gets 910 seconds of ISP. It, uh, it doesn't have much thrust, though. It's only two tons, but that's because it doesn't have much thrust. So that is the RD0410. It's basically the same thing, passing hydrogen through... And the thing about it that intrigued me, though, was that because of its size, it's obviously it was meant to be developed into a much larger engine. But its size is actually pretty convenient for a spacecraft. So this is use case number two. Use case number two is the situation where you have a crew module, you have a hydrogen tank, you can see why it is called the pair, and you have your nuclear engine, and it might look a little bit better if we tuck it in somewhat. Um, so this has 7,500 meters per second of ISP, and the goal of this is to transfer to the moon, capture around the moon, break orbit from the moon, and return back to low Earth orbit, and then get refueled. So 
as it is, it's a little bit tight on that because you take 3,100 meters per second to get over to the moon, 800 to make orbit, 800 to break orbit if you're getting into low lunar orbit. If you're rendezvousing with like Lunar Gateway or something, that's different. And then 3,100 more to uh, do a full propulsive breakdown into low Earth orbit. Now, if you have some sort of system that has a heat shield and can sort of aero capture into low Earth orbit, that's different. But that's always a little bit dodgy. And yeah, pr pr placing a heat shield around a liquid hydrogen tank like this is cumbersome. So this is use case number two. It's to do all that, we would technically take 7,800 meters per second. So we don't have that. So I hypothesized a version of this engine that they would make lighter because this is obviously a prototype. And if we make this engine lighter, and this really gets down to the difference between having a heavy engine and a light engine. Uh, the initial version is two tons. So if we hypothesize a version that's 1.2 tons, which is more in line with how Timberwind, a more advanced nuclear engine, which is called a pebble bed NTR, a pebble bed nuclear thermal propulsion system, uh, they have better thrust to weight ratio than the NERVA did and they were uh, conceived of in the late 80s and early 90s. If we have something more like that, then we have a lower engine mass, say 1.2 tons, and now we have the delta V that we need to fulfill our mission, which is to have a whole round trip around the moon and come back and then get refueled. And the mass of this is very convenient because at 16-ish tons, we have to put the docking port here, and we've assumed that this is providing power now, so this is a bimodal thing, but that's not necessarily the case. Uh, I did build in an optional fuel cell, which is why this has liquid oxygen here, so that it can use the liquid hydrogen and liquid oxygen as a fuel cell. But anyway, uh, this can be launched by Proton. Uh, it can be launched by a whole bunch of different launch vehicles. The only limitation is that its diameter is very large because again, it's a liquid hydrogen tank. Uh, so this is 6.6 .6 meters in diameter. And again, you could uh, mock this up yourself if you want to create a similar vehicle and you don't have these parts because you didn't watch that video and didn't get the link that I have on the pair uh, for these parts. Uh, you could conceivably, let's say, use a Lunar Asset module. Uh, le let me just uh, put it together without the physical pair here. So let's say we've got this 6.6 .6 meter tank and we've got... Uh, this is definitely not the way you would want it to be, but... Um, prop that up. And this, uh, we certainly want to have the aluminum lithium and hydrogen. So, uh, oh, we need to dump the prodigious amount of Arizine and NTO we have in here. As you can see, uh, if we just uh, had the lunar module here and put the liquid fuel tank there, uh, we end up with a, uh, pretty close to the 8,000 meters per second. I don't know if there's a way to make things more efficient. Oh, I forgot to put the MLI layers on the pair. That's something we have to do, and that does cut into the delta V somewhat. Okay, anyway, you get the idea about the pair. Another thing that I've discussed in various videos before is the nuclear architecture that NASA has proposed for... It, it, it started with, before Constellation, but people often associate with Constellation. It's still continuing and they're working on it. For that, it's better to go to the SPH. Well, I say go to the SPH, but we actually have to pop, in, pop, pop outside with hangar extender to get a load of this. So what this is is a long Mars vehicle. Now, I've told you already, uh, there is a downside to trying to go long distances with the nuclear stages. The moon is okay. You're not going to have too much boil off during that time if you've got good insulation and stuff. That's uh, uh, basically suited to maximum two week round trip. And by, uh, as long as you've got some sort of boil off control and uh, you've got mitigation and uh, MLI layers, then you should be fine uh, for two weeks. Uh, to go to Mars and back is a more than two year trip, uh, closer to three years. So that is probably not the best thing that NTP is stu suited for if you are you expect the whole thing to do a round trip, which we wanted to. We wanted to. 
Uh, so you're going to have to have a lot of boil-off control. But the way this is set up is this: these engines are specifically related to the NTP architecture of 2019 from NASA. And so I got the information from its uh, presentation. And each of these has 111 kilonewtons of thrust and 875 seconds of ISP is what they said. So they're 3.32 tons. That's assumed actually the mass was including the whole thing so this was all came as one unit and so they didn't break out the mass for the engines specifically but i gave it a reasonable independent mass based on previous nuclear engines so each of these segments is about 45 tons which could be placed into low earth orbit by something like a new glenn or or i i don't know about falcon heavy because uh it's not really meant to physically take up loads of this size. These are pretty wide, right? Uh, because uh, they're 8.4 meters in diameter, and that is quite wide for a Falcon Heavy, which is 3.9. So the seven meter diameter of New Glenn is more suited to it, or of course, if there's a starship that wants to pop it out, I suppose. So there's a hab up front, and that, that whole business with all of its supplies is also gonna be 45 tons. They're little uh, RCS thrusters that use MMH and NTO along the way, and they accounted for that mass. There are also solar panels because we are not assuming a bimodal nuclear engine. And so it's built up in segments uh, in orbit and then assembled together and then sent off to Mars. Now, again, we have to worry about boil off. The tanks are heavy and maybe nuclear electric propulsion will be best especially since the burn that you do it's going to be just the exit burn so what they plan on doing is they plan on assembling it in high orbit in that case they're going to have to use sls so the 45 tons is actually sls's capacity to high orbit and they are not intending to use like new glenn and build it in low orbit so they're putting it in high orbit, and then that way its exit burn is only going to need to be 500 meters per second or something like that. Which means that most of what it's going to do, it's need, and you can see that it doesn't have that much delta V. So it's going to do this exit burn like 500 meters per second, and it's going to have to do a capture burn at Mars, say 2000. Then it's going to have to do another departure burn at Mars, another 2000, and then the remainder is to recapture around the Earth. At that point, there's going to be far less uh, food, water, and oxygen up here. So what you end up having is more delta V. You can see the difference between, well, we won't be completely depleted, hopefully, but you can see that the difference between having this food, water, and oxygen up here and not having it is about a thousand meters per second. So it'll have enough to do the full round trip going there, making orbit around Mars, breaking orbit around Mars, and coming back. Um, as long as it does, has no boil off, right? And so that's a possibility. But if you're already going to start out in high Earth orbit, you don't need very high thrust engines necessarily. So maybe the nuclear electric propulsion in conjunction with some sort of OMS system would be enough and might be better. For the long, in general, for the long trips out to the planets, other planets, I would prefer the nuclear reactor connected to ion engines, especially for cargo trips. For crew trips, it's a toss-up, and this is a crew trip. So we might want this for a crew trip, but again, I've got big boil-off questions, <laughs> right? Uh, for two weeks, I'm okay for the moon. Uh, we've got big boil-off questions for this. But there is another possibility, and that's that instead of having this situation built up like this, what if we didn't expect the nuclear stuff to do all the work and instead we replace this section with a more regular propulsion section? And because I don't get to use it very often, I'm going to put on the Prometheus engine. It's supposed to be a launch engine, but uh, it's a proposed engine from the European Space Program. Prometheus vacuum engine and this engine uh, it's about a J2 level engine in terms of thrust it gets 368 seconds of ISP methane and oxygen 
Now, that still takes some insulation, but it's not as bad. And you can refuel it at Mars, potentially. You can refuel hydrogen at Mars, too. That's not part of the NTP architecture plan, but you could. This already gets 4,674. The problem is, uh, it's pretty heavy. Now, what we really need uh, this kind of stage to do is capture around Mars, uh, break orbit around Mars, and capture around Earth again. And that's a lot of the business, though. So, what we get is... This segment back here will just push it out, but it'll stay in Earth orbit. And then this will do the rest. But we've got this nuclear stuff here that will be reused and constantly be docking to new stuff and pushing it out. It probably, this will be flipped around actually. Uh, the nuclear stuff will dock to the docking port up front would be best. Okay, so one potential difficulty we have is in sending the large liquid methane tanks up, especially this one. So what I've done is I've broken it up into two different segments, the methane oxygen tank, because that'll make it easier to send up on a variety of launchers. But uh, there is a interesting situation that is developing that we can talk about. But first, uh, you can see we're full up on FUBAR and oxygen, and I've locked this tank. So this is the budgeted amount for capturing around Mars, uh, assuming that this has done the transfer. Uh, it, in principle, this has to complete some of the transfer as well, so we might want to boost up its uh, delta V a little bit more. That's 2,000 meters per second. And then here, we unlock this, and this is the fuel to get back home. And But by then, we're going to have less food, water, and oxygen. So we have 2,000 meters per second to break orbit from Mars, and then about 600 to capture around Earth. So it's pretty tight. Uh, it's doable given NASA planning and everything. Uh, the thing is that this is an easy tank to get up, uh, so that's you know 40 tons with the engine in, so many things can do that. This one though at 70 tons is a little bit hard. But we don't have to toss it to a high Earth orbit like we did with the NTP tanks. Remember the NTP tanks need to be in high orbit because it doesn't actually have enough delta V to depart Earth orbit uh, from low Earth orbit. It has to be in high Earth orbit to depart. That's why the SLS is used to put these into a high orbit. But if you take a look at the situation, this is handling all the other stuff. And then we, we only wanted one of these. There's a reason why I only want one of these tanks here. We'll get to that. So we have this situation. Now this can do 1,700 meters per second. So it's not necessary for it to be in high, high Earth orbit. It can do a lot of that at a time. Well, what I really want to do is that much, 1,113. So it's gonna be interesting. <laughs> it, it'll probably have to be in high Earth orbit like that. So the plan is that we are going to have this holding steady in high Earth orbit, and this is gonna get itself back down afterwards for fuel replenishment and docking with other stuff. It occurs to me though that we've got a problem with this arrangement here in that the crew can't get in. So we need to rearrange this somewhat. If we just want the low thrust high ignition count option, I have my ED1 engine which is just a 30 kilonewton engine. So it'd take forever to do the burns but NASA does not have any problem with that. I've got a larger engines, but having four of these is probably more NASA's style anyway. But we can make use of the rare, rarely used wasted tank. Okay, so I got the curvature of the wasted tank to match these engines, and it's got 10,700 kiloliters worth of capacity so we can take that out of this tank. Okay, so now we've got a thing and we've got better engines and we can connect up properly and I mean when I say better engines these actually have less uh, ISP. They have 360 instead of 368 so that might be a factor but in principle I'm just showing you the concept so We'll just leave it be for now, but NASA probably wouldn't want to rely on just a single engine anyway. 
Okay, so we've got this, and it would be tedious for me to launch this in pieces for the purposes of this video, so I'm going to use Overwhelming Power. And I would like to use Overwhelming Power in the form of a Saturn V with a lot of boosters. Okay, so what we have here is we don't have the upper stage of the Saturn V because we're not trying to get this to high orbit. We're going to park it in uh, lower orbit and because it's so heavy. We could, with a regular Saturn V, just divide it up in two. We've got 231 tons here. If we just took this bottom section here and separate it off from the top here, uh, roughly speaking, the top there is 140 tons. It's possible that a Saturn V with upgraded engines, and we do have those now. Uh, we are using the J2S's on the, not X, uh, J2S on the second stage. Sorry, uh, that's not right. Um, and we are using F1As on the first stage. I've also added a fourth engine here, and that's just for a mounting point, because otherwise we didn't have a location. Uh, with the NTP architecture they had, uh, th that NASA had, it, it didn't have a center engine, so there's just a Kerbal uh, convenience thing to have a fourth engine there so that I can mount it like that. We've got humongous fairings, that's another issue, right? So, I mean, it all fits because it was all always meant to be this sort of size, mainly for SLS. And so not only do we have the F1As, but it's still 250 tons to low Earth orbit. So we've got these UA1564 solid rocket motors. And in the description of the UI, UA1564, just down here it says strap on booster for upgraded Titan 3 I don't think so not with this kind of thrust and Saturn INT MLV applications well this is the MLV application so yeah 21,000 kilonewtons which means it's uh, got more thrust than the than the five segment boosters on SLS it's about the same mass as the five segment boosters on SLS um, so it probably has a little bit less burn time I mean it depends on the curve right there's an alternate configuration with a longer burn time and less thrust. We're going for, maybe we should use that. Well, I don't know. I don't want them to hang out for that long. Okay, so there's a 157 second burn time, but I don't want that. So they last less time. And that means that we have a pretty high thrust weight ratio off the pad, 1.99, which should be fun. We I've done this before on stream, but I haven't done it in a video, I don't think. I'm not really fond of uh, SRVs, but at least this should be fun. And we're not gonna have crew on board. Not gonna have crew on board, so that's an improvement. So again, F1As at the bottom, not Bs, F1As, and J2Ss. And we're probably gonna have to refuel the mission somehow, so we're gonna get to use a different launcher for that. So we'll think about that when we get there. But anyway, this will save me a whole bunch of launches, otherwise we could do it in pieces, but I think you'll agree that this is more entertaining okay here we go let's see if this can put its load into lower orbit it's a 6,000 ton rocket so basically double uh, Saturn V regular so that's special <laughs> anyway uh, throttle up SAS is on and ignition of the F1As and boosters Lots of thrust weight ratio. If you want less, again, there's the other configuration on these boosters. So we're gonna have to be fairly shallow to make proper use of them. Um, which mod is it from? It's from Fa It's based on the FASA model. And again, we're using Katniss Cape Canaveral for the Cape Canaveral area looks and launching from pad 39B, though not much structure there right now. Okay, switching the center engine off, we really don't need all that. It'd be handier if we just lit the boosters on the ground and then lit the core afterwards. Maybe. I don't think, I don't know if we'd get away with that. Okay, separation. I think I'm gonna try and release the fairings when these engines go out. We're pretty high. It might be the safest time. Okay, fairings. Um, separation of the stage. And ignition. Okay, 
Okay, we're about to expand that stage. Pretty close to orbit, but not quite there. Oh, the camera even rotated. So, good disposal for the S2, though. So, and we could just use the RCS to get into full orbit. We do have some RCS fuel for that, but uh, we'll just run these engines. There we have a Mars Tangency. But this might not be enough, as it turns out. Might need one more of these tanks, in fact. But the reason I went with this is because it's easier to refuel just two of these than trying to refuel three of them. We've had some boil off of the methane and oxygen, so apparently my my uh, MLI layers were not enough there. We've got more boil off of the methane oxygen of the hydrogen, so I don't understand boil off in realism overall sometimes. Not a good reason to avoid it. Yeah, if this Delta V is reading right, then I didn't put enough on. Now, with NASA planning, this boost up can be done much earlier. It's not... we don't have to do it, like, right before a transfer or anything. It just has to end up being in the right direction. Okay, well... Yeah, we're not getting as much juice out of it as I'd like, so I probably need an extra tank. But, we're gonna top it off anyway, and we'll proceed. Okay, so I'm going to give SLS Block 1B a go for the refueling mission because it seems to fit, but we'll see. And we're not going to the moon or anything. The, the payload is about 64 tons, something around there. And we've got the inclination going because, of course, the mission has gone a bit of a ways here. But I'm going to try to correct that on launch. We'll see how that goes. So there's just a regular SLS Block 1B here and ignition and launch actually let me check the thrust on these well that's some version of an RS-25 uh, 2280 kilonewtons uh, I do not want the fairings to go at the same time as the boosters okay booster set So obviously it turns out that the payload is a little bit too much for the tankage mass that we brought up with the nuclear engines. So it's more suited to a lower payload and I sort of messed that up. But I'll give the flow of how the architecture, I guess, how the mission scheme works. And that'll be sufficient since we're talking about uses of these NTRs. And this is one possible way of using them, which is basically just keep it in Earth orbit and have it boost payloads out, attach new payloads to it, and refuel the stage and boost it up. Uh, maybe I'll give the fairings a try after the main stage runs out. Okay, fairings. Ooh, look at that. See, that's that's why I was worried about them. Okay, separation. Oh, there's that too. Mm, nozzle extension. Okay. We probably have more than enough. So what I've done is I've taken one of these tanks and just added more liquid hydrogen tankage mass to the top of it. And that actually ends up ensuring that the RCS thrusters here are center mounted, which is good. Basically, we'll be using those RCS thrusters to dock, but we'll be using this stage to do the rendezvous. Well, I mean, they picked a good form factor. The mounting point on the SLS seems to be ideally suited to this. Well, that makes sense again. It's NASA that came up with this tank in the first place. And so I guess they knew what the size ought to be to fit this. It looks like we could carry actually way more than what we've got here with SLS to the orbit that we are trying to get to. Now we're going to be a little bit lopsided, but the target orbit is sort of lopsided too, so we'll just see are we lopsided in the right place. Not really, but it's not horrible either. So we are going to, we're, we're over here and it's there. 
Here goes the main rendezvous burn. So if we wanted to attach an extra bit of hydrogen to the mission, we might be able to do that and still launch a refueler with SLS. I wanted the refueler to be able to launch on SLS or on Starship, potentially. And uh, on Starship it might have a different form factor. This is obviously more shaped for SLS. In fact, it just fits in the fairing just about right. So that, though that's one downside. We'd have to probably make a fatter tank if we wanted to uh, add more fuel and refuel it. So, but yeah, those two launchers are what I have in mind as an option for refueling this sort of mission. Obviously, SLS has a certain benefit because it's got this stage which has hydrogen and oxygen in order to make the rendezvous burns. Whereas uh, Starship, we'd have to put some sort of hydrogen and oxygen stage into it to do the stuff. It doesn't come with one. It's also important to me that we're not using a nuclear engine on the refueler. Because we want to just reuse the nuclear engine. We don't want to send a new one up. I didn't want to do that. Technically, this stage could... Uh, if we docked all of this together to the mission, this stage could give it all a boost, but we're not going to go with that, I don't, I don't think. It's probably not going to end up being that much Delta V. Anyway, we're not lined up for Mars anyway. We're just doing the basic impression of a mission, not actually doing a mission right now. And that's good enough. Kill rotation. Uh... Let's wait for the spin to finish, and then off goes the Block 1B. A reusable refueler would be even nicer, but this is a fairly simple refueler. All it is is hydrogen tanks and an RCS system, so that's not too bad. Uh, we would probably more want a reusable hydrogen oxygen stage. Technically, I guess we should have a docking port closer to the propellant modules instead of to the habitation module to dock with, but that's not a major concern at the moment. Okay, we have connection. Well, uh, looks like we might have had a little bit of boil off from the refueler. Uh, we we're short about 360 something units. But otherwise, all right, the refueler is drained and we can decouple, undock. The idea is that we're going to use most of the fuel to boost the payload up, but then we're not going to use all of it and we're going to reserve some fuel so that the nuclear stage can recapture into Earth orbit, or in this case, because we're probably not going to depart Earth orbit, we are going to just bring its orbit down to a more serviceable height. This height, we want to bring it down to below 10,000 kilometers. I'm, uh, wow, we're, our velocity is actually dropping as we, because we're so high up now. Our velocity, orbital velocity is actually dropping as we burn. I'm gonna leave 200 meters per second and see what that leaves us with just the nuclear stage. Okay, so now we've got in daylight though. I wish the sun was on the opposite side so we could see the Earth and the vehicle at the same time properly. We are going to let go of the mission. So the mission... Well, let me make sure everything is settled. Okay. No, SAS please. Or oh, kill rotation is fine. Okay, so the mission has fuel. And it has some boil off on this. Oh, I missed putting MLI layers on that tank. Anyway, but in theory, it could do stuff. Let's, let's just, uh, it's a little bit heavy, it turns out, for what I've got here. But you could make a lighter payload for this. The question is now, oh, this only has 829 meters per second. So we have to reserve more than the 200. We have to reserve like 500, which is what this had before. So, yeah, we can't get away with 
reserving just that much. But let's see what orbit we bring this back down into. Of course, we're not on full escape. So the idea is it would actually go uh, initially on escape, uh, send the thing all the way out to Mars transfer trajectory, flip around and then close to back here where it's doing the burn after it lets go of the mission, uh, do a retro burn immediately to recapture around Earth. And then after it's done that, come around again and bring its orbit down. But we'll need to have a smaller payload in order to do that, or a bigger stage overall. Or if we have more efficient uh, NTP engines, that could be a way of going about it too. But so then, after it's recaptured, it just needs to do a light burn right after releasing the payload. It'll just be maybe 300, 400 meters per second tops. Uh, to recapture around Earth to make sure it doesn't go on full escape and then it has to loiter and wait till it gets back down to periapsis. It still wouldn't be, as long as it does enough of a retro burn, it won't be more than two weeks, which is what I said I want the limit to be for uh, these kinds of systems. Otherwise, uh, I'd probably go NEP, the nuclear electric propulsion. So moon stuff or these uh, transit trajectories that it recaptures with. Well, it's not too bad if we get back down to below 10,000 kilometers. That refueler would be able to get to it. We're almost out of fuel and it's still 50 tons. Uh, I wish it wasn't that heavy. Some of that's the MMH and NTO. That's about 4.5 tons of MMH and NTO. So it could actually do the docking. If you send a payload up, it could probably do the docking itself. It's got the RCS thrusters in appropriate locations and the RCS fuel to do it, but its RCS fuel would need to be topped off as well. Uh, it's going to end up a little bit higher than I want it to be. So we need to reserve somewhat more fuel. It could use the RCS to pull itself lower, but it's not out of uh, control or anything, right? It's still got all the RCS fuel to work with. But, uh, yep, it's just a little stage hangout in... Earth orbit waiting for another payload to push and we could use like whatever vehicle we want to to get the payload to it. It just depends on how many pieces you want to chop it up in and it'll be ready to go to dock with that and send that out. Oh the solar panel, oh because they're at that angle. Alright, anyway so that's this version but in general, the, my principles are, if it's a really long mission, probably just have a reactor and the ion engines, if you can time warp during the ion engines, right? That's a, that's a limitation in Kerbal Space Program, not a limitation for NASA. Uh, we want to be able to reuse these nuclear stages, so th that's why this is good, or the pair is good, but the, using the S2 stage for the upper stage of the Saturn V, it only gets a marginal benefit, and then you're dumping the nuclear engine somewhere, so uh, not the best sort of solution. And then, of course, finally, when you want to dispose of this, you could uh, top it off and then, with fuel and then send it out somewhere else, like if it's on its last ignition, um, send it somewhere that's already pretty radiated, like Jupiter or something. If you actually top this off, and it isn't that doesn't have a payload, it could probably get itself to Jupiter, and Jupiter is just a radiation hellhole anyway. So there you have it. So those are some ideas. Do you have any interesting uh, use cases for NTRs in particular, nuclear thermal propulsion? You could uh, tell me in the comments below. So with that, I'll say thank you for watching. If you enjoyed this video, please do press like. If you do have any comments, please put them in the comment section below, and I'll see you next time.